So let's have a lesson on this Cantabile by Meritz. And um, you can follow the lesson for free and just pick up all the tips on practicing new pieces or this piece. You might have this piece in another book, but if you need the sheet music, there's a link for it underneath the video. This is a great little piece. Um, it really explores a lot of the guitar, um, a lot of the sweet spots of, of the tone quality of the instrument and lots of sustain. And yet the technical requirements are pretty low. So it's a great little piece. I'm really happy that I found it um, because it, it'd be a really great little encore piece or just a nice easy piece that you could play for people, um, but sounds quite, quite lovely. So um, this piece, is like early intermediate. I would say like grade three, maybe grade four. Um, it's grade three in terms of like it's basic, the basic playing in this piece is very straightforward, but it does explore quite a bit of the guitar. So depending on how confident you are with um, the range of the instrument, then um, it could be either grade. So a couple of things to mention. So the this is from his method book, and this is like number seven. So it's like the seventh piece in his method book after a whole bunch of other pieces and exercises. Um, but the cantabile, that title or the indication, means in a singing fashion. So it should be quite singingly, like the melody should sing. So although there's lots of chords that interrupt things, um, there should be a really nice formed and phrased line. So that upper melody... So in, in some ways, like each two bars is a phrase or every four bars you could say is a full phrase, but you just want to make sure that you're bringing that melody out and it's nice legato, ease into it. And then let it expand. And start again. Then expand and relax. Relax, start again. So you should go through the whole piece and just practice the melody on its own. Make sure you get it the way you want it and very musically um, phrased and shaped and um, very legato the whole time. Then once you start adding the chords in, just don't lose that legato melody and make sure it's coming out of the texture. But before we do that, let's just talk about a couple of other small things. The glissandos, um, Meritz marks his glissandos in the same way that he marks his slurs. So he just uses a slur marking or a legato marking. So um, because of the way he, he fingers it in the music, it's pretty clear it's, it's glissandos though. So, so this one, I would slide until you hear the B. So you hear the B and then restrike it for the next note because there are two notes there, right? It's 16th note F, 16th note B, and then dotted eighth note B. So there are two Bs there, but I would only strike the one with the accent. But you can hear it. There's the B, and then you strike it afterwards. It's pretty close together, but nevertheless, you can get a feeling for that. And there's plenty of room for interpretation about um, how you wish to really play that. But that's, that's how I've chosen there. And he's pretty specific because he has an accent on the next note, so I interpret that as like just a plucked note. Um, besides that, um, not too much to say. Um, we just want to make sure that the other notes, you know, that don't get too, too crash and bang, you know, like we just want to make sure that the horizontal melody is, is happening still. So let's just do a walkthrough. So that might seem strange, that, that shift there. That's Meritz's fingering, and I've kept it, because there's lots of solutions that you could do, but um, his is just fine. Um, you could go like, you know, just ease your way down from the A. But be, um, something about the gesture works with his fingering just fine. Just don't shortchange the A. It doesn't matter what fingering you use, 
but um, you do kind of want to end up with third finger on there. That's one of the reasons I decided to keep it, because I just want to end up with three there. But whatever you do, just don't shortchange that note. You know, like clipping it or anything like that. Make sure you give it a little bit of time. This is not a rushed piece. It should feel very un, you know, rushed. Um, no, not too much momentum. So um, just don't short change the note. Give it a little bit of time and then just calmly shift. In terms of right hand fingering for this passage, um, I'm using my thumb for almost all the bass notes, like the stems going down. But you could easily just use I, M, and A for the second beat. You know, keeping your thumb for like the actual bass strings. It's up to you. I don't think it matters. It's not that fast of a piece and there's going to be lots of repeated fingers. Try to alternate your fingers um, on like the 16th notes. So alternate, but there'll be repeated fingers because of all the four note chords. So you can't worry too much about that. Um, from bar five. So you just want to end up with your first finger on D on the eighth measure. That way you can grab triad there. Not much to say there on um, bar five. You have to get this chord so just get that fourth finger ready to get that A. Pretty straightforward and lots of D shapes right. And relax. Ease off. Second half. Lots of ways you could finger that section too. Um, I decided to again keep Meritz's fingering pretty much. So I come back to one, two there, and then just switch my fingers. You could do a bar A and ease out, or do something like two, three, and then slide two up. I don't think it matters that much. Again, it's about making sure there's enough sustain on each of the beats that it's not noticeable if you do switch fingers around. So you just switch. Use two, three here though. All because of this D sharp that appears. And then slide down because of that. So you're gonna use three, two there. That way one can end up there. This section here, that's ninth position. So you just bring your hand up there and you have an open string to do the shift. So during the open sound of the open string, make sure you move your hand up. That way there's no gap in the rhythm. Same thing on the shift down when you play this open string, shift during the open string. So you go back to the beginning and play all the way to the finne. Um, not much to say. Uh, there are there is like a juxtaposition between the triplets and the eighth notes. So in like bar fourteen, uh, those are triplets, right? If you practice with the quarter note beat, like three, four, one. Lots of different types of rhythms, but a metronome will really help with that. Just set it to the quarter note and make sure that you're you're very even. You might want to practice some exercises doing triplets, triplet, triplet, eighth note, eighth note, triplet, triplet, eighth note, eighth note, triplet, triplet, eighth note. 
making sure that your, your triplets and your eighth notes sound fairly even, and again, the metronome can help a lot with that. With a lot of these romantic pieces that use lots of rubato, I highly recommend you learn it with a metronome at first, making sure that you can play it in time. And then you turn the metronome off and relax it all and use a little bit of rubato. But it's very important that you know the correct rhythm, that you are very confident with the correct rhythm. And then you're interpreting the music in a romantic fashion, romantic era fashion. Um, but you, you do in fact know what the correct rhythms are. So I hope you enjoy that piece. It's kind of a, it's a lovely little piece. Um, a, a kind of a good find because it does explore lots of the guitar, so it hits lots of the sweet spots on the instrument, but um, the technical requirements are not very 